Well, good morning. My name is Todd Malone. I'm the lead pastor here at FBC. It is wonderful to have you here this morning. Um, how are we doing on our Christmas shopping? Yeah, right. We haven't started ours either. Um, we've been a little bit busy this week. Ann and I have been grandparenting this week. Um, we have had an 18-month-old, uh, two-and-a-half-year-old, and a four-year-old at the house. And here I stand. Um, <laughs> I guess that's another way of saying that we have had a lot of um, loud, active fun. I have rediscovered my limit on how many times I can hear the question why <laughs> in a two minute span. Right now, I think it's about 38. We have been reminded of the deep things that we long for in life. Those things that you look forward to, that you wait anxiously for, that you wonder if they will ever come. Bedtime. <laughs> Have you noticed that if you're a parent or a grandparent, you can tell the quality of the day by when you start the bedtime countdown? Right? If you start the bedtime countdown and it's dinner, you've had a good day. But if it's like mid-afternoon, things are going a little rougher. Who here has started the bedtime countdown at lunch? <laughs> Dirk, your mother just raised her hand. I think by yesterday I had started the countdown somewhere around breakfast. Um, that bedtime countdown is like this day-long advent calendar that you just keep ticking things off until you get that moment of peace and sanity. And it's funny because there's a real sense in that that is what Advent is about. The word Advent literally means coming. It's a celebration that starts the fourth Sunday before Christmas, and it leads up to Christmas because it's a celebration that is anticipating the coming of Christ. In other words, Advent is very much about waiting. That is our theme for this year's Advent series. The title of it is called The Meaning is in the Waiting. Why? Because very often, especially in our culture, we think of waiting as a waste of time. We think of waiting as something that we have to do until we get to what matters. And we want to remind ourselves this year that God is doing amazing things in us and through us even as we wait. And in fact, one of the constant themes of Scripture is that God puts his people in positions where they have to wait. And the question that we have to wrestle with is how do we live in our moments of waiting? Now, there are different ways to celebrate Advent. Katie did a great job of reading for us that one of the traditional ways is to focus on key characters leading up to the birth of Jesus. And that's what we're going to do this year. And we are starting with the father of the Jewish people, Abraham. And this morning, we are going to meet Abraham in Genesis chapter 15. This is where he is still called Abram, but I'm probably going to call him Abraham 15 times this morning just because I'm so used to doing it. But that's okay. We know who we're talking about. And when we meet him, we see him having this amazing encounter with God. And God is going to reiterate to him an unbelievable promise that he made three chapters before. And then God is going to reassure Abram through the revelation of his character and through making an oath to Abram. And finally, we see Abram respond in faith. But let's start with God's unbelievable promise to Abram. Now, God's promise, uh, Abram, consists of two things in this particular passage. 
a people and a place. He promises Abram that he will own the land where he lives and that he is going to have a son and that son is going to become a great nation. Now, the first thing that he promises uh, is, well, the first thing to notice about the promise is that it's unbelievable because of the sheer size of the promise. I grew up in the mountains of Oregon. So I loved going into the mountains at night and looking up at the night sky. Have you ever looked at the night sky without a bunch of artificial lights from cities or houses or buildings? Because that would have been Abram's experience. He looks up at the night sky and you see stars and a sky that is overwhelming, stars that are impossible for Abram to have, to have counted. And God is saying, this is what it's going to be like for your descendants. He's not saying that the exact number of your descendants are going to match the exact number of the stars. He is saying that this is going to be overwhelming. The size, the comprehensiveness of this promise. It'll be beyond anything that Abram can understand. Now, there's something else that makes this promise unbelievable, and that's the obstacle that he faces in actually fulfilling the promise. How old is Abram? At this point, we're not exactly sure, but the good estimate is that he's probably 85 years old. And his wife, Sarah, is probably 75 years old. We don't know that for certain, but does it really matter if we're off five or 10 years? Right? The point is that couples their age aren't having kids. They aren't going to be able to look around at other people that they know and see other examples of people in their 70s having kids. This is something that they know is beyond anything that could be expected or that could be explained. No one, no one overcomes an obstacle like this. And then there's a third thing that makes the promise unbelievable. And that was that God has made this promise before, but nothing has changed. You see, back in chapter 12, God comes to Abram and he says, Abram, I want you to leave your family. I want you to leave your people. I want you to leave the home that you grew up in. And I'm going to take you somewhere. I'm not going to tell you where, but I'm going to take you somewhere to a land that I'm going to give you. And oh, by the way, not only am I going to give you this land, I'm going to give you a people. I'm going to give you a people that will become a nation and they will all be your descendants. And not only am I going to give you a people, I am going to bless the entire world through that people. Abram was 75 years old when God made that promise. And the best we can tell, when we get to chapter 15, he's been waiting 10 years and nothing has changed. He has left, as the Lord told him, but he does not have his son and he does not yet have his land. See, I think if I were Abram, I would have two responses to God's promise. Right? First, I've heard this before. And second, nothing has changed except that the obstacle has gotten bigger. I'm now 10 years older. This was unbelievable when you made this promise and I was 75 and my wife was 65. It is more unbelievable today. It takes us to a big question. It takes us to an important question. What are you waiting for? Right? Aren't we all waiting for things to in some way be the way that they are supposed to be? We are waiting for our marriages to be the intimate, supportive, encouraging relationships they were supposed to be. We are waiting for our work to be fulfilling and life-giving the way it was supposed to be. We are waiting for a sense of security and well-being not to constantly change. We are waiting to stop asking God why to so many things in life. There are so many people in this room 
right now who feel stuck in painful, challenging, difficult situations and they wonder, will they ever stop waiting for it to change? Ann and I have someone in our lives that is very, very difficult, really more towards Ann than towards me. She is someone who is constantly demanding. She is often very cruel to Ann. She is rarely grateful for the incredible sacrifices Ann makes literally every week for this person. This is someone that we can't remove from our lives. It would be inappropriate given the responsibilities that we have. But Ann and I, for years, countless times every year, have gone before the Lord and said, would you please change something? Would you change her heart? Would you change our perspective? And nothing changes. And this person will be in our lives until she or Anne dies. And it seems like there will be no relief. I can't tell you how heavily this weighs on us, but I doubt that I have to. Because I think all of us have our own situations that we can put in that category. We have our own versions of that story, whether it's family or work or school or finances or something else. And we sometimes are in a position like Abram, and we feel like we have good reason to stand before God and say, why do I believe the promises that you made? Abram had every reason not to believe God's promise. He heard it before. Nothing had changed. But Genesis 15 gives us more than an unbelievable promise. It gives us a picture of God's character. And God is the believable provider. Look at how God is identified in these passages. Look what it says that God does. The Lord identifies himself in two different ways. In verse 1, he calls himself Abram's shield. He is saying that he is Abram's protector. If you were to go to the chapter right before this, in chapter 14, Abram is involved in a significant battle against an overwhelming foe, an overwhelming army, and God delivers him. So when God says that he is Abram's protector, there is immediate history that God can point to to prove it. In verse 7, God calls himself the Lord who brought you up from Ur. This again is referring back to chapter 12. God told Abram to leave his family, his people, the place that he knew, and go where God led. In the years between chapters 12 and 15, Abram has traveled to Egypt. And in Egypt, God had to supernaturally step in and protect him. Abram dealt with internal conflict. And God had to step in and say, I am still watching you and will provide for you. But not only did he have to deal with internal family conflict, Abram had to fight extraordinary, powerful external threats. And every step of the way, God guided Abram, even when Abram's path looked chaotic. God is Abram's protector and his guide. And God also does two things in this passage that are very, very bizarre. At the end of the chapter is a very bizarre ritual that God has Abram do, right? Abram is supposed to take these animals. Three of them he cuts in half. The birds, we don't really know what happens to them after that. And then we probably underplay this. But what does Abram have to do after he cuts the animals in half? He's got to protect them. He's got to fight off all of these birds of prey. That's just bizarre. He spends the day doing that. And then at night, Abram falls asleep. 
And while asleep, God reaffirms his promise and appears as a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch and passes between the dead animal parts. And there's a lot of speculation about what's going on here. And you'll hear a lot of people say that they know what this means. But the reality is, we're not exactly sure. But here's what we do know. There were a whole bunch of cultures around Abram that did some rituals that weren't exactly like this, but were very similar. And there's even reference to something like this in Jeremiah. And you put those together and you start to see that there's probably something that's going on here that we can nail down. Let me try to create a modern day picture of what this might look like. It would be common in those days if one king conquered another nation that they would actually have them go through a ritual, the the losing nation go through a ritual like this. So let's say, for example, something happened that upset the people of Texas yesterday. And they decided that what they needed to do was invade Oklahoma. (laughs) But this time they won. (laughs) Now, if the Texas king wanted to let the Oklahomans keep their land and their homes, this is what he would do if he were in that culture. He would make the Oklahoma king go through a ceremony just like what Abram went through, right? So he would take some armadillos and you would cut them in half. And then the king would walk through the middle of these halved armadillos. Why would he do that? Because this is a symbol that that servant king is making now to the master king. And he is saying, I commit my loyalty to you. And it's possible that he is even saying, if I am not loyal and faithful to you, you can do to me what I have done to these animals. And if you understand it in that way, do you see how what God is doing in this passage is turning this ritual on its head? God is putting himself in the position of the servant, pledging loyalty to Abram. It's possible that God is going so far as to say that if he breaks his oath, may it be done to him what Abram did to these animals. And the point is that God chose the most graphic, powerful, visceral way in that culture that he could say to Abraham, there is no way he is going to break this promise. And let's not miss something important. Who's actually making this oath? It's God. It's God who's making this oath. In other words, God is saying, it is not up to you, Abram, whether the terms of this agreement are kept. It is up to me. It's up to my character. It's my responsibility. God does one more thing that is maybe less bizarre, but I think is equally stunning. God gives a picture of the future, and then he says something about his motives. There's going to be a period, God says, when it's going to look like God has abandoned his promise, but he hasn't. He's actually doing something else. It says in verse 16 that he is letting something play out with a different nation, the Amorites, and it needs to play itself out. What's fascinating is God doesn't say what it is that needs to happen. He doesn't explain why it needs to play out. He only says This has to happen. And then what I'm going to do with you will take place. 
You see, God is at work in the entire world in ways that we will never know, but in ways that could intersect our story. God gives an unbelievable promise. God gives an incredible picture of himself. He is a guide and a protector who is unfailingly faithful. He is at work in everyone's story, not just yours, not just mine. And sometimes what he's doing in the story of another person intersects our story, but never in a way that he forgets his promises. Waiting bothers me, I think for two reasons. First, it feels like a waste of time. It feels like nothing is happening. And it also bothers me because I fear fear it's going to be pointless. What if I never get what I'm waiting for? Do you see how what God does here addresses both of those? It may feel like nothing has happened, but God is at work. It may feel like a waste of time. It may feel pointless, but God is going to make good on his promises. Does that mean if I wait long enough, God is going to fix this person who causes Anne so much pain? Does that mean eventually, if we wait long enough, every relationship that we have is going to be mutually encouraging? Every job that we have is going to be fulfilling? Every financial need is going to be met? Every disease is going to be cured? We live in a fallen world. That is not necessarily what's going to happen. But Jesus made a promise in John chapter 10. It's a Christmas promise. That never occurred to me until this week. Jesus made a statement in John 10 that's all about Christmas. He said, there's a reason that I came. It's a reason that I left my father in heaven. I was born as a baby. I came that you might have life and have it abundantly. An abundant life is what, at our deepest level, every one of us longs for. But abundant life is not the same thing as a pain-free life. We live in a broken world with broken people. We are broken people. An abundant life is a life with God while we wait even in painful circumstances. If we think of the abundant life as having all of our expectations met, we are going to live in frustration. But that is not the reality of the abundant life. The abundant life is what we receive when we live like Jesus in a broken world. What makes it abundant is not the change in our circumstances, but in the ways that we are transformed. Literally, almost every single day, multiple times a day, Anne must extend forgiveness, kindness, grace, and patience and wait for the day that this person will change. And that change may not happen this side of heaven. Does that mean Anne's waiting is pointless or a waste of time? No. It means that God will continue to protect her and guide her God will faithfully give Anne the abundant life, even in the middle of pain and fallenness. And he will do that by changing her to look more and more like Jesus. God makes an unbelievable promise. And then he explains why it is in fact believable. Because the faithful God is always at work, protecting and guiding and keeping his promises. And then Abram responds, with a belief-filled response. Verse 6 is one of the pivotal points in Abram's story. In fact, the Apostle Paul looks back on this very verse as a defining verse for understanding God's relationship, not just with Abram, but with all of us. And it says that Abram believed the Lord. The word believe means to stand firm, to be trustworthy. The way it's written in the Hebrew seems to indicate that this is the moment that Abram settled into trusting that God is who he said he is and will do what he said he will do. If you have ever been on a zip line, you know this moment. Right? You walk up, you pay the money that you're going to pay, and in that moment, 
you have confidence that that zip line is going to hold you. They hand you paperwork, helmet, whatever else. You sign the paperwork, and then you start your climb up to the launching point. And on that climb, you are confident that that zip line is going to hold you. But you start to wonder why you had to sign a waiver that said, if you die, it's your own fault. And then you get to the platform. And you look down 836 miles to planet Earth. And you wonder why they gave you a helmet. Because if you fall, the only use of that helmet will be to scoop up what is left of you to carry it away. At what point has it settled into you that you really trust that zip line when you step off the platform? It's one thing to be confident when the consequences are out there somewhere. It's very different to be confident when you are face to face with the consequences. It is one thing to sit in here and say, I know that the Lord is my provider. It is something else to be at work and faced with the decision. If I do not do this thing that I believe is unethical, I will likely lose my job. Is the Lord my provider? It is one thing to sit in here and say, I know that God meets my needs, even my emotional needs. It is something else when we are faced with the temptation to cross lines that we should not cross with people we should not cross them with because we feel so emotionally starved. That's when things get settled in our hearts. What do we really believe about who God is and how he's working in our lives? The question Abram asks in verse 8 isn't from a lack of faith. It's really just an honest request for encouragement in his belief. See, Abram is just like us. His faith might be settled, but it's not perfect. He wants reassurance. As soon as chapter 16, he's actually going to do some things that will show a profound lack of faith in God. What makes Abram's response a belief-filled response is not that it's perfect. It's that he is settled in himself that God is trustworthy, and that conviction sets the tone for the rest of his life. He's going to have moments where he acts like God isn't trustworthy at all, but he's going to keep coming back to the foundation that God can be trusted with his life. And that is our belief-filled response as well. It's that settled trust in the character of God as we wait for things to be the way they are supposed to be. And that day will come it will come when Jesus wipes out all the fears, insecurities, and selfishness that destroys our relationships. It will come when Jesus reverses all the confusion and chaos and disease that infects all creation. Ultimately, it will come when Jesus returns. What are you waiting for? Are you waiting for relationships to be fixed, a career to be fulfilling, finances to change? maybe the next phase of life to begin. Those are all important things to look forward to. And if they're broken, and all of them are in some way, it's important to work on how to fix them. But what we are really waiting for goes a lot deeper. We are waiting for the Lord to undo the brokenness in a broken world. Our deeper longing is for relationship unspoiled by sin, for work that is life-giving, for security that doesn't come and go. God's unbelievable promise to us is that it is going to happen. 
we might get a glimpse of it in this life. But all of it will completely, fully, perfectly happen when Jesus returns. What are we supposed to do when God puts us in a season of waiting? Right, we want to do something. We ask that question, God, I'm sitting here, I am waiting. What do you want me to do? Here's the story. Here's the power of Genesis 15. The truth is that God puts us in positions to wait so that we would do nothing sometimes. So that we would do nothing but focus on what God is doing, not on what we are doing. If God has you in a season of waiting, there might be valid things for you to do. But the most important thing for you to do is to wait like Abram, settled in your heart that you trust God. If you are in a season of waiting, maybe the question to ask is not, what am I supposed to do? Maybe the question to ask is, who do I believe that my God is? God made an unbelievable promise to Abraham. He would make an old man into a great nation with their own land. God would bless the entire world through that nation. God reassured Abram with an oath that vividly portrayed God's faithfulness. Abraham responded in a settled trust that the Lord would be who he said he would be and that he would do what he said he would do. And then Abram went back to waiting. And you know what's fascinating? He will wait another 15 years before the birth of his son. And you know what's even more fascinating? He will not see the great nation. He will not see the nation that lives in that land. He will not be alive when Jesus is born. He will see those things from heaven. But he will not see them in his lifetime. But that doesn't mean God wasn't faithful. See, the story of Abram is a reminder. A reminder of the point of the message, really a point of the whole Advent series. Life with God is a life of faithful waiting. God has made an unbelievable promise to you. A day is coming when the love, fulfillment, security, and joy that you so deeply desire is going to be yours, and it's going to be yours perfectly. He has even promised that between now and then, he will give you an abundant life in a broken world. But the key is this. Whom do you trust? Have you settled in your heart that your trust is in God's protection and guidance, his commitment to fulfill his promise? How do we respond to the fact that the life with God is a life of waiting? I want to suggest four points. The first one is to pray. That's always the first point. We always start with going before the Lord. Pray that he would help you strengthen your trust in him every day, that every day you would know his character a little better, that you would know him a little better, and that you would trust him more. Go through the discussion questions with someone this week. Don't try to live the Christian life alone. You don't have to use the discussion questions, but that's what they're there for. Take some time and review Genesis 15. We've been doing this throughout the year. For every passage that we discuss on Sunday morning, I encourage you to go back and take a look at that passage again and make a list. What do you learn from this passage about who God is? And then I want to encourage you to identify someone to reach out to this Christmas season. A neighbor, a co-worker, someone who doesn't know the Lord. Identify that person this week and begin to pray for opportunities to connect with him or her. There's one other way that we want to respond to this message, and that's through communion. See, communion and Advent really go hand in hand. Both are about remembering, and both are about waiting. With Advent, we look back on the coming of Jesus to fulfill the promise God made to Abram, 
all the way back in Genesis 12 and 15. Remember that God put Abram and all God's people in a position to wait on his timing to fulfill his promise. Most importantly, we remember that God fulfilled his promise by sending his son. With Advent, we look forward. Jesus will come again. He will make everything about us and about creation the way it is supposed to be. And Apostle Paul tells us that something very, very similar goes on with communion. And he says this in 1 Corinthians 11, and I want to read that for you. As I read that for you, servers, you can go ahead and get in position. Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 11, For I receive from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night that he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he also took the cup after supper, saying, the cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat the bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death for how long? Until he comes. Communion is about remembering that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise that God made to Abraham. Jesus came, he lived a perfect life, the life that we are supposed to live. Jesus died on the cross and his death was a sacrifice that took away all of the guilt and all of the punishment we deserve for not living that perfect life. And then Jesus was raised three days later. And that same power that raised Jesus from the dead lives in each and every one of his followers. And it is the power that enables us to live a belief-filled life as we wait. Communion like Advent also looks forward. We will continue to do this together until the day that Jesus comes and makes everything the way that it is supposed to be. We will do it as a tangible expression of the forgiveness we receive from Jesus and the new life that we can now live. At FBC, we do what's called open communion. This means that anyone who is a follower of Jesus can participate. A follower of Jesus is someone who has settled in their hearts that they are sinners. They can't come to God through their own goodness or own power. The only thing that gives them a right relationship with God is the relationship with Jesus Christ. And if you've that settled in your heart, then please feel free to take communion with us today. If you've not settled that in your heart, I would encourage you to use this time to settle it. Settle it that Jesus will be your Savior. The way that we do this is we're going to pass the tray. When you're given the tray, give that to the person next to you. Let them hold it while you take the cup and the wafer, and then they'll continue to pass that down. Um, hang on to the cup and the wafer because we are all going to take it together. If you need something that is gluten-free, we have that at the very back, and you are welcome to get up and uh, go to the back and get that, and then come sit down, and we will take this all together. So servers, you can serve.
In the same passage in 1 Corinthians, Paul tells his readers that they are to examine themselves, that they not take communion in an unworthy manner. And I think that is something that we should do together as we go before the Lord. Would you pray with me? Father, we come before you, and we recognize that we are sinful people. We have done things this week, we have done things today that are dishonoring to a perfect, to a holy God, that are not consistent with your character. Lord, we have left things undone. We have said things, we have thought things. We have left encouraging words unsaid. Lord, there are so many ways that as we look at ourselves, we are we recognize that we fall short. But Lord, we stand before you not on the basis of what we do, but on the basis of what you have done and what you have done through your son. And we take communion today, Lord, as a tangible reminder that the forgiveness, the relationship, that we have with you is because of the death of your son. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. The night that he was betrayed, Jesus took the bread. When he had given thanks, he broke it. He said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. They ask you to pass your cups to the center aisle. And let's go ahead and stand together and pray. Father, we have proclaimed the death of your son and we will continue to do so until he comes. And we live today waiting for that day. We live today waiting for the time when all of the sin and ugliness, the things that we don't like about ourselves or the world that we live in will just be wiped away and no longer a part of our experience. That we will see one another for who we truly were meant to be, and that we will see you and relate to you as we truly were meant to. Lord, we live waiting by trusting you until that day comes. And we pray this in Jesus' precious name. Amen. So here's our reality. We live in a broken, fallen world. Things are not the way they are supposed to be. But here's the other part of reality. That's going to change. And the truth of our God is that our God is faithful to fulfill all of his promises, including that one. So leave here today with the confidence of knowing that God will fulfill the promises that he has in your life to make you like Christ. You are dismissed.